All right. Hi, everyone. I hope everybody managed to make it to the room. Uh, for those of you um, not sure where what this is, this is the breakout room for the session on the declaration um, for the future of the internet for the private sector. So if you if you are in the right room, this is this is what we're going to be talking about um, in the next hour or so. Uh, really trying to get together and see the private sector's opinions, ideas about the declaration of the future of the internet. So um, please take your seat. Uh, how we're going to do this? Um, there is a microphone in the middle of the room. Um, I don't think we were able to to do rowing mics uh, in the room. So if you have something to say, I will ask you to please come up to the um, microphone and uh, and share what you'd like to say, um, so everybody can hear you. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and second thing, thank you very much for fulfilling a dream of mine. I've always dreamed of being a tour guide, so now I've done that. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, what we're going to do today. Um, is really just try and go through what's, what, what has happened in the past year or so around the um, declaration for the future of the internet and uh, understand how the private sector um, feels about not just what's in the principles that were presented to you earlier in the main, uh, main conversation, but also we were reminded that um, if principles are just there on a shelf, um, they really not, that don't serve to that much, right? So what we're trying to see is how can we move to their implementation? And a lot of the speakers today have already said that implementation really requires a multi-stakeholder involvement. There is not much that can be done um, by any one stakeholder on their own. So what we're trying to suss out today, uh, based on your uh, experience and your expertise, is um, how can the private sector help um, in uh, implementing some of these principles? What are some of the obstacles that we see uh, around the, these principles and their implementation? And, and what are some of the channels um, that you see that can be used to, to take this to good version? So we're going to start uh, with a couple of questions um, in three parts. Um, first of all, um, talk about the priorities um, of, the, of the DFI. Uh, what are the, in your opinion, what are the, prin the principles that are of top priority for the private sector? Um, and what are the ones that um, can be acted on uh, as priority or should be acted on as priority? Those, no, those are not the same questions. What, are, what is that more ripe for action? And then, of course, what is it that we should be working on for other reasons? Um, the second theme of our conversation will be how do, can we cooperate? Can we find modalities for cooperation um, between the private sector and governments, of course, but also with the broader multi-stakeholder community? Um, how can we facilitate dialogue um, and can the discussions um, around the operationalization of the principles? Um, and uh, what is it that um, we can bring in as a multi-stakeholder community? What is it that we can leverage as private sector? And then the last bit um, that we will try and get to is success. What does is, what is success look like in this? Um, and how are we defining it? Uh, but also, how are we measuring it? So it's, uh, we have the principles. We'll talk about how to implement them. But then also, how we measure if we've done our work correctly. Um, so that is just a quick setup from my end. And um, to make sense of this all, I want to introduce you to my colleague, Natalie. Um, uh, Natalie here uh, is going to be our rapporteur. So she'll try and capture all of your um, well thought out comments and, and, uh, uh, and advice uh, for us. So with that, um, let's just jump right in, I suggest, and, and talk about our first question um, of our first team. Um, we're going to allocate about um, 20 minutes for that conversation on the priorities. So what do you think uh, from the principles, um, the DFI principles, what is of the top priority for the private sector? Um, and what is the, what are there, what are elements there that are low hanging fruit perhaps that we can, we can start actioning on as a multi-stakeholder community? And this is a breakout room, it's not a panel, so I won't be speaking. Uh, I will do count on you all 
to, to really have a, a debate. So who would like to go first in sharing what you think the top priority principles could be? Hello, is this on? Yes. So um, thank you very much, Tamea. Uh, my name is Keith Drazik. I work for VeriSign. Um, VeriSign has been and is a longstanding supporter of the multi-stakeholder model. We've been active at IGF, uh, in the ICANN community, obviously, uh, as it relates to our role as a registry uh, operator for .com and .net, among others. Um, and VeriSign is a strong supporter of the principles in the declaration for the future of the internet. I think this is a very, very important document. It's a very important approach and an opportunity for expanded engagement. And I think um, from, a, from an operational or tactical level, what more can the private sector do and what should our principles and our priorities be? I think the number one answer is to be more actively engaged in outreach and active engagement with other parts of the multi-stakeholder community. Um, I think historically we've seen in the IGF context that, uh, that the private sector has been involved but perhaps not as actively involved in some of the communications and the development of workshops and proposals for IGF meetings. Um, I think that there is value to be had in the private sector identifying uh, more specific and concrete opportunities for engagement with civil society, with the technical community, perhaps to a lesser degree, I think perhaps civil society, and uh, sorry, private sector and, um, and technical community are perhaps already more engaged, but I think really important for the private sector to engage more actively and proactively with civil society so that we can work together and present multi-stakeholder outputs to governments. Right? I think what we've seen over the last 10 years, and I'm just picking, you know, pulling that number uh, from the ether, but over the last 10 years, we've seen governments become much more active in I internet regulation, either to, you know, in a, at a national level uh, or a regional level. Uh, and I think that if we hope to support the multi-stakeholder model moving forward in the face of increased and increasing government regulation of the internet, then we have to work better together as private sector, technical community, and civil society to present a united front uh, that really supports not just the multi-stakeholder model itself, uh, but outputs and outcomes that help to promote trust. Uh, you know, and, all, and the principles that are highlighted in the DFI principles and priorities um, is that we have to do more and more proactively together. Um, so that's a bit of a high-level statement. I have some more specific and concrete thoughts about how we might do that in specific areas, but I'm going to stop there and see if anybody else would like to get in the queue at this point. So thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Putting this aside. <laughs> All right, so thanks so much, Keith. Um, 
apparently you stopped the system with those, <laughs> uh, which is very seminal <laughs> comments. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we are looking forward to some of your more specific points when we move into cooperation modalities and operationalization um, of the principles. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so what we've Number three, yeah, okay, perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, so what we've heard from uh, Keith is the, the, the importance of not just working together individually with governments, but also for us in the multi-stakeholder community working more with each other um, in spreading the news and the information about uh, the principles and actually showcasing outputs as a common um, multi-stakeholder community. Um, and what I liked what you said, Keith, there is that this actually builds the trust that we need to be able to move forward with some of these principles. Um, so how do we move into that and into making sure that these are instruments for us to use and not just some principles that we keep and we subscribe to but um, don't really implement in our day to day? Would anybody like to react to that um, vision? So Barbara, please, and then I don't know your name, the gentleman with the glasses, but I will turn to you after. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, no, I thought um, Keith's comments were spot on, the importance of, of collaborating together um, among the stakeholder community so you're, we're not seeming to uh, work at cross purposes. Um, I think you know if the stakeholders can come together, then then you have we present a unified uh, point of view, particularly in in a UN body that has a, a broad cross section of governments and countries participating. But I I wanted to speak you know to build upon Keith's point and speak to one of the priorities, and um, I think um, we cannot emphasize enough the importance of inclusivity and connectivity. Uh, affordable um, connectivity and access to the internet because if you don't have connectivity, then you, you basically don't have anything. You don't have the internet. So um, I, I would um, suggest that we prioritize that as, uh, as an element of these principles to uh, focus our, our uh, 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 unified uh, engagement uh, with other stakeholder groups. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm very scared to turn the microphone on, but it's working, thank you. Um, so yeah, noted that. Um, turn to the basics and make sure that we have universal meaningful connectivity for all. Uh, that's where we should start. Thank you, Barbara. Um, the gentleman, please go up to the microphone and then please introduce yourself so that don't keep calling you gentlemen. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Charles Chaban. I represent the International Trademark Association, INTA. I think some of you already know my colleague, Lori uh, Schulman. Uh, she's not here this time, but uh, many of your firms, I'm sure members with us, I know. So building again on what uh, Keith mentioned, which is very important, and to dig directly to some private issues, maybe one of the uh, principles is trust and privacy, which is very important, of course. For in, 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 in the terms of data privacy, as an example, I think we should prioritize a process with, to pr in addition to protecting the privacy, to be sure that there is mechanisms in case someone uh, in interfered on intellectual property rights. So how, for example, uh, if someone is trying to do something which is against your rights, which is uh, trademarks, patents, etc. But mainly this is important to find a way in the processes with the uh, multi-stakeholder to talk about it and to give it to be, sorry, sometimes I confuse myself. Uh, anyway, um, mainly it's, I'm trying to say to we have to find a way to have a process always clear in addition to protecting the privacy to be sure how to be able to reach for example an infringer and i know this is not an important usually point in sometimes in the internet governance in general but i think for a private sector this is something important and at the same time even for the civil society because this uh, even protect the consumer rights at the end thank you Thank you. Um, so making sure that when we look in 
deep into a priority, we're looking into protecting one special um, rights or, or, or want to take policies and, uh, and measures in, in one side of, of the topics, we don't lose sight of its implications on other conversations, right? So we're taking that holistic approach, um, uh, I think is something that we should know. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Charles. Um, anybody else would like to take the floor on the principles? Um, the gentleman here, and I know Mar Mark, you're already standing, so please go ahead, Mark, and then, and then you. Thanks, Tim Ayer, and uh, good morning, everybody. Mark Carvel, I'm an internet governance consultant. I used to work for the UK government. I'm now involved in the private sector, so that's why I'm, I've moved in this direction. And uh, I just wanted to pick up really on, uh, actually, I think it was a point that Keith made about uh, governments increasingly getting into regulating <coughs> in this sphere. And uh, how should the private sector respond to that. And I think if we look at the roster of priorities in the, in the uh, declaration, you've got a lot there on trust and specifically on combating the harms online. Uh, that first bullet, work together to combat cybercrime, cyber-enabled crime, deter malicious cyber activity. <coughs> and then... Uh, Further down, consumer protection. I think the, the message from governments really is, uh, and I was, when I was with the UK government, there was a kind of sea change of policy. Ministers when I was advising were saying, we've got to end the wild west of the internet. And it's no longer the policy of the UK to be totally hands off, which I was pushing ministers to sustain. Yeah? Uh, within a multi-stakeholder multi government uh, context. So governments have seen uh, it's important now to get a much better grip on tackling the harms and risks and the growth of all the negative stuff that's online. And I think the DFI is a valuable opportunity, a platform, for collaboration involving the private sector, much more assertively by the private sector, to work with government on those particular priorities. That's where I, I would suggest uh, s some specific focus be applied uh, when we come to implementing uh, these, these, these uh, principles. And, and that intersects valuably, I think, with the whole global digital compact agenda and, and uh, ultimately the risks is plus 20 and, and demonstrating through the DFI initiative how multi-stakeholder engagement involving, m as, as Keith was saying, much more active commitment by the private sector to sort of um, defeat this assumption that the private sector is only in it for the money and not for social and, and uh, uh, the welfare of citizens, and also the welfare of businesses. Businesses are vulnerable to all these harms. So I hope those comments are helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, yes, addressing this possibly false dichotomy around uh, private sector interest versus everybody else's interest. It's our, our own interest in, in moving this uh, forward as a multi-stakeholder community. Thanks. We, we were noting that. Um, you wanted to share something. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Samir uh, from uh, Dialog Asia, the telecom company there in Sri Lanka. Uh, maybe I'm, I have a very limited exposure on DFIs, but when I went uh, go through the principles, maybe what I wanted to highlight in terms of the priorities. Now, let's say we uh, whole world went through a COVID situation. So what happened is compared to the you know, Europe or maybe uh, American region, maybe the especially in the Asian uh, region, I can where I re what I represent. So we saw a lot of unconnected connecting, okay? Because they, they didn't have means of, you know, doing their businesses or education or healthcare or whatever, otherwise, you know, getting connected. So we connected new, net new, additions of millions of people getting connected to some something which was not very familiar with because they didn't have any other options rather than getting connected. So we need to take care of, you know, this 
new millions of you know who got connected and especially uh, areas like you know privacy uh, cyber security uh, so that aspects uh, we need to be very careful and you know just uh, prioritize on those aspects in sri lanka actually we are working on the uh, online safety bill so it will be passed very soon in the uh, parliament because you know like those who connected newly connected to the uh, sort of uh, uh, internet so we need to ensure that you know they are like safe and they can continue or on the other hand them to be connected the the uh, the th third point uh, rather inclusive and affordable so maybe the the private sector and even the government and you know all those other stakeholders can play a major role so who got connected who got benefited if we are to sustain that we need to ensure that it's affordable and you know like uh, inclusive so those two i think uh, maybe probably this might uh, valid for the african region as well the those uh, new internet users uh, so those two priorities i think uh, uh, we need to you know focus more thank you so we're moving along nicely in a, in a pace of connecting everyone and then once you're connected what what what's necessary for you once you're online and what you can do uh, and what others can do for you to make sure that we are all in this um, together. Um, and I do have a point there that I, I want to ask the room as well. Um, of course, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, Mark, you said uh, governments want to protect their citizens, they, uh, companies want to protect their users once online. Um, from the user perspective, uh, I know we are here to discuss the private sector, but what can the private sector also do? Maybe build capacity, to um, or to help these other different sectors uh, work together. Uh, so what is it that it's the private sector responsibility, but then what is our responsibility to um, work with others in, in this aspect and work with the users that are coming online? And what can the private sector do to help, not just from thinking of what we can do, but what we can do to help others um, uh, once online? So it's just a question to all of you um, to think about. And Suki, you wanted to share something. Um, thank you, Tibia. Suki Dofa from GIZ, German implementing agency, private company owned by the German government. So I'm also somewhere in between. Um, and I would recommend actually to work and cooperate much more closer with uh, institutions uh, such as Smart Africa in Africa that is responsible for uh, um, um, building and developing the connectivity in, in Africa. And I think that um, it would also help to identify some um, public-private partnerships and identify some success factors and to see, uh, um, to create a win-win situation for everyone because I think the private sector is not so much interested in, in just discussing things but seeing some benefits out of the cooperation. And I think that's why I think it's very, very important to come up with more private, uh, public uh, private uh, partnerships. Thank you. Noting, noting that, and that's, that's a clear answer to how we operationalize also some of this conversation, which we are slowly going to move into. So I'm going to give everyone a last chance to talk about the priorities, if there's any, any more priorities that you think we should be looking at. If not, then we're going to move into um, the direction that we're organically moving to anyway, because I see you are all thinking about um, operationalization and how we actually move into some of those priorities that you've noted. So we've heard we need to connect the unconnected. Um, we need to ensure that there is trust online once uh, people are connected um, and that elements of that trust include um, security, privacy, uh, protection of consumer and but also intellectual property rights in a, in a more holistic fashion. Um, so how do we move to actually make this happen? What is the what are the elements that we need um, to operationalize these principles that you've noted as priorities? Um, what can we do as private sector to make that happen? What are we expecting from governments to do to make that happen? What are we expecting from other parts of the multi-stakeholder world? Um, and how do we work together? So I'm simplifying three big questions that we have here on the screen. Um, but really the, the gist of it is, um, how do we really move to action? Um, so what is it that we can do and what are we expecting others to do? 
Keith, you said you have some points on that, so <laughs> I'm going to call on you first, but um, others, please uh, prepare your comments. Okay, uh, th thank you very much, Tamea. Um, so again, Keith Drazik with Verisign. Um, I'm gonna provide maybe a case study or an example, uh, I think, that might help frame the way I see an opportunity for the private sector, the technical community, where there is some overlap, obviously, especially when you talk about uh, uh, internet technical operators, um, can be both private sector and technical. So, um, and, and the importance of engaging with civil society and governments uh, in this particular example. So uh, as we've noted over the last several years, there have been references to trusted flaggers, right, or trusted notifiers particularly coming out of some um, legislation and regu regulation in the European Union. And I think that is an example of an area where there's a need for a multi-stakeholder informed discussion about what it means to be a trusted flagger and what the implications of trusted flaggers are generally when it comes to um, you know, freedoms online, privacy, due process, recourse, proportionality of action, and I'm tying this in a, in, a, in a way back to Mark's comments about online harms and the mitigation of online harms. Um, I think at a very basic level, uh, it's really important for the multi-stakeholder community, including governments, including those that are regulating, to understand the roles, responsibilities, and capabilities of the various actors in the internet ecosystem. The, the service providers. It's really important for regulators to truly understand what a registry does, what a hosting provider does, what an ISP does, what a registrar does, you know, the, the range of actors in the internet ecosystem, uh, you know, in the stack, if you will. Um, it really matters uh, who you're targeting with regulation because the roles, responsibilities, and capabilities of the various actors are distinct and different. And so I think when you take that and then add on a question of a trusted flagger and how a trusted flagger would interact with any one or more of those operators in the stack, it becomes very convoluted and very complicated. And we have heard already from civil society their concerns about trusted flaggers being so-called shadow regulation or um, you know instances where there would be lack of due process outside of a traditional court system. So for example, and this is the example, if there is harmful content being hosted by a hosting company that is using a domain name uh, and there is a trusted flagger who has identified this harm and is interested in being the most effective and efficient in removing that harmful content or mitigating that online harm, it's really important for that trusted flagger to know who to go to and who to expect to take the most appropriate proportionate um, uh, action in terms of that mitigation strategy. But it's also really important for the trusted flagger to be held to account in that what they are reporting or flagging to the technical operator is supported by evidence and that there is recourse for the impacted party, that the action being requested is proportionate or proportional, that you're not having excess negative blowback because of a, an action taken at the request of a trusted flagger. So I think this is an example where governments in regulating and suggesting or encouraging trusted flaggers, uh, civil society who have legitimate concerns about negative impact on end users or um, those that uh, you know host a website, uh, and making sure that the operators are receiving well-evidenced and actionable uh, reports that are routed to the appropriate party. And I think that that is an example where there is a need for a multi-stakeholder dialogue. And it's probably just a, just starts as a dialogue, but it could evolve into something a little bit, you know, more structured or more, you know, comprehensive in terms of, a, you know, an operational approach. Um, so just an example. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful. Happy to hear anybody else's thoughts on this one. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Keith. Um, I would add one question to that. Do you see that model happening at a national, international, subnational level? Or where do we start? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think I think the that dialogue, uh, as you know, by way of example, needs to begin 
uh, in a bit of a uh, sort of an organic bottom-up way where you have uh, industry coming together and making sure that the operators are talking together uh, to make sure that there's better communication and collaboration among the, the technical service operators, the uh, internet service providers, if you will, ISPs, hosting companies, registries, registrars, resellers. Um, but I think it's really important to augment that very quickly with uh, you know, the inputs from civil society and the inputs from regulars and government um, and the technical community to, to, to a certain extent. Um, and so I think that that needs to start at a national level, regional level, and then evolve into something because clearly we've seen that there are um, extra territorial or trans, you know, trans border issues when it comes to some of these issues. So I think it is a bigger issue that needs to be tackled, but I think it needs to probably start at a regional level, um, you know, just, to, just for, for, for logistics, right? <laughs> I think just for to be able to, you know, achieve. So I, I would look at, um, and I know we're talking here about the DFI and the principles and the priorities, but I think I, I see IGF, national and regional IGFs, as, a, as an excellent opportunity for this conversation to begin and to continue. And I'm sure there are other examples uh, that can be identified of this type of multi-stakeholder engagement and dialogue, but I think this is one where when we talk about the mitigation of online harms, the roles, responsibilities, and capabilities of the actors and how they are informed of the harms and how they handle the harms uh, to make sure that end users are not disproportionately uh, negatively impacted by those decisions, I think is a, is a critical component. So, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> so if, if I would draw a flow chart in my mind um, on, on how this were to go, we have the principles that were defined um, by governments internationally it should loop back into the grassroots uh, where multi-stakeholders can come together, go back up to the national level and back to the national level to international policy com conversations. So we do this in cycles um, and then we go back and uh, take this cyclically in a way that, that we can move organically between the bottom up and then uh, the international cooperation levels. Um, Thanks, just trying to make sense of, uh, of how you see this happening. Amado, you wanted to, to share something. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Amado Espinosa from Latin America. Uh, I am uh, a little bit uh, concerned, Tine, about the F of this meeting uh, because I, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly, the points already raised are very key. Uh, I mean, from the technical standpoint, and also how the governments can react uh, at the parliamentary level or at the executive level and whatsoever. But big industry, I think they are, after ChatGPT, uh, I think they are now uh, taking the lead in terms of the F of this meeting. Then um, my Recommendation, uh, Timea, is I don't know if the ICC will be the proper channel for a call for proposals, for example, in terms of uh, how can, I, I can talk on behalf of the Latin America industry, IT industry, uh, how can we get together and try to make this kind of definitions of these principles in terms of the uh, impact into our societies? How are we going to solve all those technical issues? Be they are very, very, very key. But the main concern right now is how are we going to deal with the uh, arrival of this huge AI wave that we are uh, experiencing right now? And if we really want to uh, see more private companies investing in AI with a certain kind of code of ethics, um, uh, trying to, to figure out this future of the internet. And we are going to collaborate all together in order to solve these technical issues uh, as well as the uh, infrastructure problems that we have in our region at least. Then uh, how can we get really the big industry here at these discussions and share with us 
the way they used to do at the this very 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 high level meetings they uh, take part of uh, wh in which direction the, the technology is going then uh, maybe uh, one proposal would be right now for cooperation to see how can we get all together the different uh, sectors from the industry because we are uh, at the different uh, layers of the internet and how can we have a common ground point to bring to the table to discuss with the governments and also to offer something reasonable for the society and also having the academy supporting our initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amaro. That's a, a, a good point on and not treating industry as, as a monolith. Uh, I mean, governments are all not the same. Industries uh, are all not the same. Civil society is all not the same. Um, so indeed, we have different sectors. Uh, we have different sizes, different capabilities in, 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 uh, in the private sector. So how do we make sure that all of those perspectives are taken into account when we when we look towards uh, operationalizing <laughs> the principles and really looking towards our, our, our shared future. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a good point in, in uh, figuring out really um, where are some of those spaces um, that uh, that the various types of industry can can connect um, and work together um, to share perspectives um, so that that can then be taken into other other communities that's that's a good point and we and we're taking taking that um, yes please Hi there, I'm Luisa Tomar from the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, thanks to Mia for hosting this. So I just wanted to make the comment that I think uh, with the, the principles, they're somewhat from the perspective of, you know, democratic government and opportunities for private sector to improve how they, they build and deploy technology. And I think uh, in, with my organization, we work globally in all kinds of uh, complex environments with local business communities. And the reality is that oftentimes their governments are the bad actors that they're sort of engaging with. And that often can trickle up and down. So I think when it comes to the multi-stakeholder process, there can be sort of um, government and civil society can sometimes forget what private sector may be up against in some of the places where they're uh, deploying technology, often for the purpose of accessibility and, and bringing new people online. And so I think there needs to be more thought about how the multi-stakeholder process can support private sector in those situations and sort of not treat private sector and one as monolith, two as um, you know, the technology providers are sort of the the bad guys in the in the room. Versus, you know, oftentimes they're dealing with they want to uphold these principles, and yet the the government that they're actually um, dealing with is is not. And so, I just think there needs to be a broader consideration of where the multi stakeholder process can come in, and which elements of the stakeholders experience what and where support from other governments or supports for, from civil society uh, come into play. And I just think that piece can really be missing. And in terms of this declaration, I, I do think it it doesn't feel written from, from that perspective necessarily. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Louisa, just, I have a follow-up question, if, if you don't mind. Um, I was just wondering, do you see potential for multi-stakeholder collaboration, um, industry collaboration in country to move the needle in, in some of these uh, instances to, to get more governmental support towards the DFI? Yes, I mean, I think that it's essential for global business and technology companies to be engaging with the local business community um, in country and supporting their advocacy efforts around this. I do think that's already taking place. I think some of the gaps can be that other governments or other engagement government to government is not necessarily considering 
where the private sector is already sort of pushing one element or another, um, and then there can be a gap between like government to government engagement where the dialogue is sort of happening separately and not necessarily more cohesively. Um, but I also think it has to be at like a multi-stakeholder level as well, sort of an appreciation of what it can actually look like on the ground as a operator or other provider um, versus simply like, um, you know, these companies sort of have free reign in, in every uh, market that they may be present. If that, thanks. Thank you so much. That 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 is really helpful, and it's really moving us into the direction of the conversation that um, we were instructed to go to to really think a little bit about um, also how we can make sure that those countries that have um, signed on to the DFI are effectively implementing it, but also think about, um, and this is the next question I would like to move into if there's no more um, input on the previous one, what can we do to move further support um, towards these um, principles? Um, and I realize that I'm assuming that we think that we should uh, build more support, but if anybody wants to talk about uh, something else, uh, or do you think that this is enough, the support that we have for the DFI, feel free to voice that as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm starting from, from the premise um, that we would like to see more support for the DFI. If so, um, what do you think the private sector can do, what the multi-stakeholder community can do to expand that support into other regions? Please. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Samantha. I'm an uh, uh, attorney at law from Sri Lanka. I think it's um, very important that the, that the regulatory and the law enforcement aspect of the future of the internet is looked into. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the UAI Act is just about wrapping up, and there's a US AI Act, so we're looking at AI sort of being very, very prominent in the future. And in Sri Lanka, we just passed the Data Protection Act, and we really need uh, the law enforcement community, starting from the courts to the regulatory authorities, taking a lead role in this. Thank you. Thank you for that, Samantha. So um, what I take away from your comment is, if we look at it issue by issue, if we see common topical issues arising across the globe, such as AI, for example, can that be a driver uh, for us to think about broader principles on the internet that can connect us and, and move perhaps a bit more interoperable action um, on some of these processes so we don't think about them in silos. So moving principles can move action on topical issues, but also concerns around topical issues can have us think about the principles more broadly and, and move towards um, more acceptance and implementation. Thank, thank you for, for sharing that. Any other thoughts on either how to operationalize the principles in the countries that support them or move to new supporters? I see a couple of people who haven't spoken. I'm not going to call uh, you out, but just know that, that you are um, very welcome to, to share any thoughts that, uh, that you might have. We still have about half an hour um, in, in, our, in our conversation. Please, John. Thanks, Tamia. Um, one of the real strengths, I think, of the Declaration for the Future of the Internet is the coalition of countries that's pulled together, uh, which I think it has countries from across the development spectrum, uh, and who have just very different stages of, of regulatory infrastructure in place that relates to technology and the, the internet itself. Um, oh, I should say I'm John from Microsoft. Um, and I, I think that's a strength probably to be leveraged as it relates to just the modalities and processes that are in place for creating regulations to begin with. Um, and that countries, um, especially the ones who are more advanced in developing regulatory approaches should consider how those approaches are going to be modeled elsewhere in service, sort of the you know, first attempt at, at pursuing this legislation um, and how that might sort of 
percolate throughout the rest of the uh, DFI ecosystem. That could be a real strength, uh, whereby the DFI community is able to sort of evangelize what they found to be good regulatory approaches across different spaces, what they believe to be good multi-stakeholder consultation processes across that DFI space. Um, there's also a lot of risk, though, that it can kind of create you know, races to the bottom or um, outcomes where if countries are not being as, as mindful about that multi-stakeholder inclusion or what the practical impact of certain policies are going to be in one space, um, that they may well then be uh, mirrored or attempted elsewhere in ways that are less successful. The one policy that jumps to mind right now is the uh, European Union's uh, CRA, and particularly its uh, provisions around the mandate and the re uh, reporting of a known exploited vulnerabilities, um, something which I have not met a security professional or anyone in industry thinks that's going to do anything but make the security system worse. Um, but even if you, know, you think that your government could pursue that uh, pr policy responsibly, th it would be hard to justify, hey, everybody should have a similar vulnerability reporting requirement um, for known exploited vulnerabilities for which there's not yet a patch. Um, and so thinking about how we're including multi-stakeholder voices in developing those policies to begin with as a model throughout the DFI ecosystem, and then thinking about how the resulting policies that we come up with are then going to be replicated throughout the DFI ecosystem, I think is important as well. Thank you, John. That is really a, a good point. So how can this coalition um, act as a multiplier for best practices, um, as a safe space for discussing challenges that, that we, we all face? Um, and perhaps if we can share those outputs, um, that can also drive uh, more um, supporter signatories who, who come to this coalition um, as a space for, for helpful resources. Um, so we're, we're noting that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, there, please, Mark. Yes, uh, thank you. Mark Arvell, uh, uh, independent consultant. Um, just on operationalizing the principles um, for the partner governments, it's about 67, 70, something like that, the number. Um, I think it would be a good message for the private sector to say to those partner governments, let's develop some effective mechanisms for engagement on how to develop policies that will implement these, these principles, be it online harms, um, protecting intellectual property rights, uh, serving the interests of uh, data privacy in the health sector or whatever. Um, and uh, I mean, in the UK, you know, we've had quite a good track record of establishing advisory groups. I, 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 I participated from the, UK, the government side in an advisory group with private sector and civil society and the technical community around the table. And we would talk about what's happening globally, but also what's happening nationally. On, on some of these uh, key issues, data privacy or whatever. And so for the private sector to think about um, models of mechanisms for that kind of discourse, that's going to be meaningful and, and influential. And that is, that is um, also taking into account the diversity of the, um, the private sector, the point that was raised earlier, which is very challenging. But I mean, when I was in government, you know, who do we talk to? Uh, you know. <laughs> If it's on the education side or agriculture, you know, or in, ter in terms of digital policy, it's, it's not easy to identify and get them in all in the same room. And the problem for the private sector, we understood, was that, you know, that's, it's time consuming for them. It's a cost. Uh, but they should, the private sector should see it as an investment of time to ensure that the right kind of policies are developed that are going to foster innovation and, and uh, help the private sector, the, the commercial interests, but at the same, t same time serve the interests of citizens and, and address the sort of political concerns and law enforcement, point made about law enforcement agencies. They need to be involved in this discourse too. Um, uh, so th that, you know, developing a model of a mechanism like that, drawing on examples in the UK and other countries have already tried to establish. And we have a regulator now taking up the whole issue in the UK on, on online uh, safety. You know, the, the legislation's now passed, it's now over to the regulator. 
um, Ofcom in the UK's case. Um, so the regulator needs to have the opportunity to engage effectively with the private sector too. Um, and then uh, on this point about um, engaging those, those administrations that are not participating in the DFI initiatives, I think the private sector, uh, especially the bigger corporate entities, could have a role there to, to engage administrations that are not signed up to this. And there are lots, you know, where is Mexico, um, uh, Egypt, South Africa, Morocco, a lot of these countries, you know, Indonesia, uh, uh, they're, not, they're not engaged. But the private sector, through their corporate networks, can usefully message about this uh, in support of those efforts by the, the lead governments and the European Commission and, and so on to advocate much more signing up by many, many more governments. Because it, it needs beefing up in terms of numbers of partners, certainly. Um, okay, thanks. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Those are, those, uh, are some, some really practical comments, uh, which well, we're used to fr from your side already. Um, so just, just to make sure that we note everything that, that you've said, um, we will have um, noted here that we need to share information um, from the private sector of what is it that, how do we see the process of our own involvement into some of these um, these processes at the various levels uh, at, of national policy making, regulating cycles. So from this moment that we discuss it, um, the moment we pass legislation on it, we, met, we think about policy frameworks, we pass regulations. So we need to have that cycle, first of all, understood by the private sector. Then the private sector needs to figure out where they can come in on that. And then the private sector needs to be vocal about how they would like to be part of that. And that also includes capacity building within the private sector to be willing to do that, and capacity building in, in the government side to be willing to do that. Um, and then to your point about um, making sure that the private sector engages its own corporate networks um, to influence others, I would like um, reactions on that, I think, from the room. I mean, it's a very interesting point. Um, and where that information from the private sector towards the government should come from. Is it um, from large companies, small companies, domestic companies, foreign companies, um, different sectors of industry? Um, I think that, that that's a lot to unpack uh, on that particular point. But you wanted to share some. Yeah, thanks. Building on that, I'm uh, David Sullivan, uh, lead the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, uh, which is a partnership of providers of digital services working together to articulate best practices for trust and safety online. Uh, and so I would just, I think, um, well, I, Mark's made some tremendous comments, but I don't know that the metric of success for the DFI is the number of governments that commit to it. I think it is successful, meaningful implementation of it within the governments that have committed to it that share the values of the document working together with the multi-stakeholder community. Uh, and there, I think that the risks that I see for the private sector in this is one, that um, practices or regulations not developed with input from the practitioners are imposed on the private sector in a way that is not necessarily proportionate to the role of particular players in the stack uh, and uh, or the in particular jurisdictions which are challenging, which may fall outside of the partnerships, uh, of the, the signatories of the DFI. And so there, I really think there is a incredible, like there is already a tremendous amount of work that's being done by the private sector relevant to the principles in the DFI across many different coalitions and partnerships at the international level, at the national level. Um, and I think being able to articulate those in a coordinated way and help make sure that those inform the implementation is really the key here. So that, that's just my quick point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that consultation and, and working together on, on some of these frameworks and policies means buy-in when it comes to implementation. Um, so that's that, yeah, that was a really important point to raise. Um, so so we're so we're noting that. You already started talking about measures of success for for the for the DFI. 
Um, and that is going to be the, the last part of our conversation. So I want to stop here and ask any but he feels that have anything to share on operationalizing the principles, uh, moving towards um, implementation. Um, I want to make sure that you've all felt heard and, and had the moment to share your, your thoughts on this, and we can obviously circle back. But if not, then um, I, I suggest we, we start moving towards the last part of the conversation, which is what does success look like? Uh, what does success look like for the DFI in general, for the individual uh, principles, and what does success look like from the point of view of the private sector? And then as you think about that, if you can add to that, how do we measure progress? Uh, and how do we measure our steps towards that vision of success? And this is the moment to, to be idealistic and share all the great ideas that you want the DFI to accomplish. <laughs> I wasn't planning to talk, but uh, I think Mark mentioned a remark that can answer your question. In my previous work, more than 10 years ago, I was part of ICC basis, by the way. So um, one of the issues that happened with me, because I live in Jordan, and although I, I was representing a private firm, uh, the Jordanian minister back then of telecommunication asked me to represent even Jordan, because she noticed they weren't active. So when uh, Mark mentioned that Egypt and other countries in, in the world who are not represented, maybe not participating in IGF, doesn't know what's going on. So maybe we can use the par private sector people to make sure one of the you know, maybe success uh, stories to try to move it to the governments of the countries who are not able to attend sometimes or not able to participate. So just thinking loudly with you, thank you. Thank you, so um, making sure that those actors involved in the process um, act as multipliers uh, and create that ripple effect with their, in their own communities, that, that is one, one success. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Amado, please. And you know, I think the, uh, well, uh, also the, an answer for, for Mark's question is, uh, yeah, I, I'm coming from Mexico and I, I will say probably, probably the government, the officials, uh, the, the, the official agencies rep re responsible to be here at this meeting are not here because they are not, they are not feeling the, the requirement from the private sector, from the uh, civil society and so on. Then. Uh, but but th this is also a very good point. Maybe they have not really the means of the people who can attend. And th yes, that, that could be another possibility. Th that, that's why I think uh, if there is an organization who can make this invitation, this open invitation to, to the different uh, stockholders to discuss, it could be, the, at least in Mexico, a very good way to start. Uh, Maybe it is IGF through another organization. Uh, ISOC is supposedly uh, is supposed to support IGF, but I, I don't know. Probably the pathway is still the same, and the measure of success would be how can we really be able to work all together and have this kind of commitment? If, if the government cannot attend this meeting, but maybe the private sector can also represent their interests. Thank you. Okay, so so we're, we're percolating around this um, uh, idea of um, defining success, not in the number of signatories, but in the number of partnerships and successful um, implementation projects um, uh, that, that are, are happening in a multi-stakeholder fashion. So I'm hearing a lot of support for that. Barbara, you wanted to share something. Thanks very much, and I realized that I didn't identify myself earlier. I'm Barbara Warner with the U.S. Council for International Business. Um, sort of building on all the comments that um, people have made, and this goes to the role of the private sector, you know, I would just, and I just, um, you know, when I'm uh, speaking to uh, other policy professionals and, I, and they say, well, what, what does this, you know, digital 
economy issues, what are you talking about? And I say, well, you know, one of the buckets would be, we would consider would be internet governance and the uh, eyes glaze. You know, I would just love it if, um, maybe this is more of a public outreach role. I would love it so that, um, you know, the average person could pick up the newspaper and read an article that just explains what the business community is doing and how, you know, how, why internet governance is important to the individual. Um, th th that's a that's a fantasy. It's a very high aspiration, but so that um, because e you know this is the future of the economy. This is the future of uh, uh, of innovation and uh, societal welfare. And you know, people that aren't at the IGF aren't in this space. Oftentimes, just don't even understand the concept. So, you know, very high aspirational that we'd ha we maybe um, private sector could undertake a, a really um, a fundamental public education effort which would in turn have um, ripple effects in turn, you know, to our government representatives and so forth. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. A, a question back to you, but, but to the, the room in general as well. Um, why do we have this challenge? Uh, and, 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 and I see that as well. In myself, mostly when I, I start writing talking points, to people who don't necessarily talk about this every day, they tell me this is not the language that everyday people speak. You need to go and think about this in a way that I can read this paper uh, and talk as if I'm talking about it. And we find ourselves a lot in this space, talk about these policies, we're so invested in them. Um, it's like we're talking a foreign language. Why? Why is that and what can we do to make this relevant to the average person um, in the here and now, but to the average person that, as Amado said, is concerned about their future on the internet. Um, so, so what is it that, that the DFI can do, and what is it that the, the private sector can do to um, build that bridge between policy ivory tower and the here and now uh, in our everyday lives? And if somebody uh, has that answer, <laughs> uh, we'll give you a prize. So, okay, thank you, Tamea. It's Keith again. I apologize for taking the microphone so much. Um, I may not have an answer directly to your question, but I think it's really important when we talk about success criteria to note number five under the, the principles, which is you listed as protecting and strengthening the multi-stakeholder approach to governance that keeps the internet running for the benefit of all. Right? And so I think there is benefit and success. There is a success threshold in having a multi-stakeholder, a healthy, vibrant multi-stakeholder community and dialogue and interaction. But I think it's really important in order to achieve that is to identify key areas of concern that a multi-stakeholder dialogue can deliver upon, right? And especially as we anticipate government regulation, because look, governments are going to legislate and governments are going to regulate. That's what they do, right? They, and I'm you know, preaching to the choir, but um, that's their role, is to protect the interests of their citizens, um, respectively, and you know, from their perspectives. And I think that, that point, that from their perspectives, is, is critically important. And we as the private sector, working with civil society and the technical community, need to ensure that governments, as they legislate and as they regulate, do so in an informed way. That, you know, I think as I said at the outset, we've seen over the last 20, 10, 15, 10 years, now even more recently, governments are getting much more active in regulating the internet in all of its you know, components and, and forms. W it's even more important today that we make sure that as they become more active in regulating the internet broadly, uh, that they do so with information, they do so in an educated way. And I think we as the private sector have a role in that, as has been mentioned here, but I think we need to do so in collaboration with the civil society actors and the technical community to really present a unified multi-stakeholder front when it comes to governments. So governments look to this community of multi-stakeholder actors um, you know, as, a, as an informed resource, as a resource, not as competition. So thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you, Keith. That's that's a that's a really good point in, in making sure that um, yeah, that the uniform un unified fo um, voice from the multi-stakeholder community um, is is not something that we just talk to the governments about, but we talk to each other about, and and and, and we try and find some of those commonalities in in, in what we want to say, but also how we work uh, with one another. Um, Helen, you wanted to share something. Hi, I'm Helen from Amazon. Um, I think that one of the points that I think we can do better collectively in order to sort of like get the get the messaging across, in addition to having a unified voice, as Keith mentioned, I think is also be more deliberate about capacity building and, and training. And I think that applies not only to skills training, but also what are the risks that we observe as consumers and as users of the internet. And I think that by communicating that to the global community, we can also achieve the goal of making the, of making the DFI have more, more meaning to those who don't live and breathe um, IGF. Thank you. That's great, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, indeed, we are here and we talk about these things as well, but it, most of the sessions we always go at, we need to talk more. Uh, what we need to be more strategic about is who are we talking to? What are the topics that we're talking about in a, in a fashion that really mobilizes action? Um, and I'm making sure that all of this talk that actually goes into um, an output that is impactful uh, for the moment when we actually need to um, move into the action uh, and, and inform that action as best as we can uh, based on our own individual experiences uh, from the perspectives that we each have as, as stakeholders. Um, and that requires uh, a lot of conversation, um, but a conversation with a purpose that actually builds understanding, um, capacity, uh, awareness, um, et cetera. So Kate, okay, you wanted to share something. I found your question very interesting because, I mean, uh, coming from the EU, we have a very strong, I don't know, I mean, regulation in general, uh, data protection, for instance, and my nephew recently said to me, oh, data protection, that's so 80s, you know, so old-fashioned, and I was really scared. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, okay. But the thing is that I also uh, Googled once um, um, Global Digital Compact, and there was no single article in the German press on this theme. And it's also the same, I just Googled the declaration, right? And there was also no single article in the German press on that. And I think maybe we should also start communicating with the media, you know, to do some capacity building, not only amongst us in the multi-stakeholder multi uh, um, group here. And I mean, we are all aware of everything, right? Because we are now talking about this, we are spending time here in Kyoto, but actually the, the German press, for instance, and Germany is actually quite good in capturing a lot of topics, but for them it's just, it does not exist. So maybe we should also start working much more uh, um, with media in general. Thank you, thank you, Suki. Um, making some of the boring issues newsworthy, right? If I can go there <laughs> as, as a moderator. Uh, sometimes when you go into this um, churning machine of policy, it, it does seem removed from what we feel it's impactful or it's removed from what we feel is newsworthy, especially when there's so much happening around us. Um, so we need to find a way of connecting the dots because we were talking about the same things, but perhaps in a different language or in different silos. So connecting the dots and making conversations that are trying to move some of those newsworthy items forward be part of that discussion. So, so that's that's a good point, and and we do need uh, uh, alliances with uh, with the opinion formers and and the news organizations and and other um, other media to um, to talk about this. Um, it's a really good point, John. You wanted to share something more. Hey, John Herring from Microsoft again. Um, yeah, when it comes to 
like what does it mean to, to actually be implementing these and upholding these, I, I think that comes down to accountability for the countries. I and mean, this is a fundamentally agreement between governments um, that we are all here because we identify with and want to support as, as pr values and principles that should underscore the internet. Um, but I think as a baseline, this should look like um, identifying what are the low-hanging fruit policies and practices that are kind of non-negotiable that governments who are subscribing to these commitments you know, really should be abiding by. Um, and there's, I mean, I come from a cybersecurity background here, but I'm sure there's like lots of these across different spaces that are related to this. Um, but yeah, it's hard to meet under, to, if you're purchasing the services of private sector offensive actors or cyber mercenaries, right? If you're using the Pegasus software, it's hard to see how you could be, you know, a good actor as it relates to um, protecting human rights and the fundamental freedoms of all people or protecting privacy. Um, if you don't have a vulnerability um, equities process in place so that people can understand how you will triage the discovery of a known vulnerability, whether you're going to disclose that to a vendor or retain it to be weaponized, hard to see how you can be living up to that commitment to promote trust in the global digital ecosystem. Um, you know, there's a lot of just sort of basic policies like that that a lot of governments have adopted, certainly not enough, and certainly not the entirety of the DFI community. So there's a real opportunity here, uh, I think, for that community of of governments together with multi-stakeholder partners, including the private sector, to identify what are those kind of low-hanging fruit baseline commitments that kind of should be non-negotiables. And then where can that be tracked in a way to say, that, hey, this community is trying to live up to these commitments, at least from a policy perspective, um, whether or not that drives the, the requisite output is something to be uh, you know, evaluated later. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sure if you ask the signatories, they say it's all non-negotiable, but <laughs> um, we definitely uh, we need to figure out the ones that are, are ready for, for action across the board um, and, uh, and make sure we share, as you said earlier in your comments, share what, what has worked in implementing that. And then the multi-stakeholder community um, I, does have, uh, I think, a, a unique way of, of holding people accountable. Um, to that, so it's not just um, coming up with the principle, sharing our good practices, but also vet that good practice through the multi-stakeholder lens and say, you think you've done right, have you done right enough? Uh, is there anything more that you can do? Or is, is there anything else that we know that you should try and implement or build on, on what you're already doing? Um, and this is not, a lot of the times when you talk about implementation of, of principles and reporting on that, it comes out as, well, I don't want to report on that because I, I, I'm afraid to share my failures uh, or that I, 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 I don't want to share that I haven't done enough. Um, so we also need to be careful about not making this a shaming and naming list, but rather uh, incentivize uh, input. Um, so there's a fine balance there. So we need to make sure, I guess. Um, and sorry to preach from the dais, <laughs> it's the, uh, the role of the moderator sometimes, um, but I think it, it's important um, that we create safe spaces for dialogue, uh, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, we have uh, about 10 minutes to be back in the room, um, and then uh, at, at 11.30 we will, we, will, um, we will have a 15 minute break between 11.15 and 11.30. Um, so we have about 10 more minutes for discussion. Um, so, Mark, you want to share something in the measures of success, but I'm going to ask for last comments from the room. Yes, um, thank you, Tamea. Mark Alvell, um, uh, Internet Governance Consultant. I think there is an opportunity here for the private sector through, through the DFI. Um, because as I, as I understand it, um, this is a turning point for the initiative to, to move it into a more uh, multi-stakeholder um, platform. Um, and if, if there is the ambition, I think it's stated in the declaration, to engage with the existing processes, including a lot of processes that are fundamentally uh, intergovernmental, the, the UN, uh, ultimately the WISTIS plus 20 review, for example, um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 agenda, um, and, and uh, external to the UN, the G7, and the G20, um, and, and so, and the OECD, you know, has the opportunity for the private sector 
through, through advisory committees to, to engage and promote the DFI uh, principles. So if the private sector partnerships with the DFI initiative really take off, that provides a channel for the private sector into a lot of these um, strategic, high-level intergovernmental processes that are going to determine the way forward for AI. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to determine the future of the IGF and, and multi-stakeholder process in general. So I think uh, it's a message from the private sector here should be, yes, we, we want to engage and strengthen the DFI through our effective partnering with, with, uh, with the, uh, the, the governments that launched it and with the civil society uh, communities and the technical communities as well. Um, because it might be a missed opportunity, you know, and uh, I, uh, I, I really think this is a, uh, an important opportunity in the timeline, especially the UN timeline, that uh, looms large over everything here. And intersecting, I missed out the GDC, the Global Digital Compact, for the, for the DFI, and the private partners in the DFI to engage effectively in the, in the next stages of the GDC negotiations in New York, where it's really still unclear where there is going to be any meaningful stakeholder engagement uh, to continue after a few initial consultations by the tech envoy and, uh, and a deep dive by the co deep dives by the co-facilitators. Um, so DFI, I think provides um, a vehicle for the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's helpful um, in, in terms of DFI being, so not just using um, the GDC and, uh, and, uh, and whistles um, in thinking about how we can further the substantive points of the, um, the DFI into some of these conversations, but also thinking how we can share the spirit of DFI as a multi-stakeholder initiative uh, that, that it's turning into um, to be to bring that into these processes and, and in itself um, create opportunities for multi-stakeholder input. Um, so it's it's a two-way street um, and, and I think that's a that's a very astute comment on that. Anybody else wanted to sh want to share anything on on the opportunities and success uh, visions? If not on that, then I'm going to ask if there's any last comments, um, anything that we haven't asked, but you feel that we should have asked you. Okay, um, and then I'm going to ask uh, one last question. Um, any projects, opportunities, work that you have done in your own organization um, that uh, was meant to further some of the priorities, principles in the DFI. Um, have you done it with that in mind or have you realized now that you have done things that are actually aligned with, with what's in there? Anything that you might want to share from your own companies, your own life? Please. Yeah, I'm Samira here again. Uh, that is exactly what happened, you know, just when I'm going through the principles, you know, like uh, relating that to uh, what we have done. Uh, so one thing, maybe if you, uh, any one of you, you know, take your phone and, you know, just uh, search, you know, cheapest internet in the world, uh, very sure, you know, you'll get Sri Lanka at the top. Okay, so uh, that is the kind of maybe knowing, knowing not knowingly, um, aligning with you know these uh, principles, you know, like uh, we there in the country, you know, we have made it make it affordable, more inclusive uh, to get majority of the people as many as possible to you know come on uh, board and you know benefit out of the internet, uh, which is the theme of this uh, forum as well. Uh, and some observation, uh, maybe how that has been driven. Uh, there, are, um, I think I can talk about Sri Lanka as well as even in India, uh, how the competition how the regulator has used the competition uh, to you know, make it more affordable. 
it's in a more sustainable manner. In, I think in, in India, it is competition has driven the probably the uh, cheapest uh, internet there. Uh, in Sri Lanka, it went to the extent of you know regulator has to come into the picture and you know regulating. They are nicely doing it actually. Uh, they are regulating the minimum price. The normally you regulate the uh, ceiling price, but they are in Sri Lanka uh, regulate regulate the floor price. Okay, so that why they regulate the floor price that is to you know sustain that uh, businesses nicely. Uh, ensure that it win-win. Maybe the end user get the best price, so it's more affordable. While doing that, you know, you ensure the uh, the businesses. The, these are businesses are you know sustainable, so you can continue to do so. So that has been something uh, probably you know like other countries uh, can adapt as well. Just want to share. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and and I, I had my suspicions that sometimes we talked about in the beginning of the session. Um, the private sector does um, what they do with a purpose, and that purpose is not necessarily um, only economic, uh, but it's uh, to have more broader societal implications. Uh, and then you look into the principles, and then you realize my own ethos and my own company, that why we are doing certain things actually aligns with these principles. So we need to highlight those areas. Um, and I mean to highlight those areas also externally, not just in our own companies, to say, hey, this is this is what we're doing. It actually aligns with a broader um, strategy, a broader purpose, uh, and we have here's that coalition that can further that. Um, and through that, uh, we can probably uh, operationalize not just our own collaboration better with our own governments, um, but also um, try and move that cooperation of governments uh, with each other and with other stakeholders uh, in the stack, as, as we've called it earlier. Um, I'm going to end on that note because we are out of time, but I want to thank you all for the very engaged conversation. I've learned a lot. I'm going to try in the next five, 10 minutes to put all that together so we can report back um, in the plenary. Um, but I'm going to put a challenge uh, uh, in front of you um, to Correct me if I don't report correctly in the room. Be vocal um, over there as well. If there's anything that I omit to say, um, please um, please do uh, engage and share that with uh, with the rest of the room. And challenge number two is now you have to find your own way back. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.